Good morning. Well, Amber's back there in the back, and she is ready. She's pumped. So if your kids want to go to Children's Church, she, she can follow Amber downstairs, and uh, we shall pray for them, or pray for Amber, or probably Mrs. Barnes. I'm so sorry. She's so proud of being Mrs. Barnes, and I forget all the time. I apologize. I, I heard her sneezing. I didn't know what it was, but now, now I get it. All right, well, I uh, just want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, my name is Ruben. Uh, I'm uh, trying to make sure I get to know everyone. So uh, if, I, if I come up to you and, and I'm like, hey, I'm sorry, what's your name again? I apologize. Uh, I am working on it, so uh, just remind me. And if you're new here and you're just visiting, there is a guest card in front of you, hopefully, in the pew in front of you. And so if you wouldn't mind filling that out, we'd love a record of your visit. You could drop it off in the offering box, which is in the back. Uh, the offering box is really for our church and for uh, the work that we're doing as a local community to further God's kingdom. And so uh, if you're uh, supporting God's kingdom, I would encourage you to give uh, to the work that God is doing. Uh, But if you're a visitor, we'd just ask you to fill out the the guest card and drop it in there for us. All right. And so we are in the book of 1 Peter today. And the reason we are in the book of 1 Peter is because I'm now the pastor of Living Hope Church. And I was like, what does that mean? You should probably know what that means. So uh, that's why we're here, because this is, this is the one passage in all of Scripture where we really get this phrase, living hope. So First Peter chapter number 1, it says, living hope. And, th- and so I think that's ideally where the, the thought came from for why this church has this name. And so I want to kind of express to you my heart of what my understanding of living hope is. And uh, to... This passage, I'm going to skip the first verse, okay? You guys are welcome to the, the first two, uh, two verses. It's, it's really just this um, a greeting, uh, but then uh, this where I want to start is verse number three where it said, Blessed be the God and Father. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, we're trying to understand a different language. We're trying to understand the way people spoke thousands of years ago. And so we use the word that, you know, Easy, most easily translates to blessed. Um, but, you know, because, you know, I'm pretty sure I know where bless you came from. I think, I think it came from the Black Plague, right? Like when people would get sick and then people would say bless you because they're trying to cast the demons out because when you got sick, you died, right? It was really bad. And so I think that's why we say bless you. And so like when we run around saying all day, oh, bless you because you sneezed, you know, sometimes I think we miss the impact of what does blessed mean, right? Um, because he's not sneezing, right? And he's not reacting to someone sneezing. He's actually saying, in effect, he's saying, praise be, right? Praise be to God. Like, he's lifting up. He's, he's excited. He's thankful. He's rejoicing. He's saying, praise be to God, right? And so, really, this, this book, you know, we're not, we're not going to study the book of First Peter right now. I really, I, I love Peter a, as a character in Scripture, and so uh, I love his writing as well. And this first, this first book is actually all about Christian suffering. You know, what, what is life like, you know? If we kept reading in verse number six and, or seven, you know, we'd start to see that, like, man, in life, we, we face some suffering. We face some hardships. We face, you know, Jesus calls it persecutions, and, and James calls it trials, and, and, and like there's all kinds of different words to describe this, this suffering that we can, we can experience as Christians. And, and Peter writes to, to Christians in, in all these multiple different places, right? These uh, Jewish believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, he's writing to them about Hey, you're going through this hardship, and here's what we need to do about it. But he opens his letter with this, like, beautiful, wonderful, praise be to God. You know, it's reminiscent to me. One of my favorite books in Scripture is the book of James, right? And he just opens up, and he's like, hey, it's James. I'm writing to you. And count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And it's this crazy juxtaposition where both these guys are recognizing there's hardship, there's struggles in our life, but man, there's this joy that's exuberating, that's exuberating, that's 
emanating, that, that's surrounding them. It's coming from them. There's this joy. that, and, and for Peter here, his joy, his praise is directed towards God. His praise is directed towards God. And so he, he's praising God, and what he's praising God for is this living hope. He says, we have this living hope, and I'm going to thank God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to say that he is worthy of following. I'm going to to magnify him. I'm going to talk about him. I'm going to point other people to him because of this living hope. So the first question we want to ask is, where does living hope come from? Where does living hope come from? Well, as we look through this passage, there's, there's going to be one name, and the answer is Jesus. Living hope comes from Jesus. And I want, to, I want us to see from this passage how, how we get this from Jesus, okay? So living hope. First of all, if you look there in verse number three, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these are all... Uh, in all honesty, there's a lot of meaning and importance to each of these words in this. Um, and and I, I, I don't, I, I, want, I want to keep today a little simple. Um, and so, like, I don't want to dive into this too far. But he, here's the first thing I want us to recognize is where does living hope come from? It comes from Jesus who is who he is. I'm sorry, I, I was... I was going to say something else, but then I looked at the blank and it wasn't, I had to do it right. Jesus and who he is. So we have to answer the question of who is Jesus. See, there, there's lots of answers in our world today, and there's lots of ideas about who Jesus is. But for us to say we have living hope, we need to be getting living hope from Jesus, and we have to understand who that is, right? Because first of all, what we want to see is that he's from God, right? He's, he is the, 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 it says, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord, and Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's this father and son relationship, and, and we struggle maybe to understand what that means. We quote really good verses like John 3, 16. It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And well, what does that mean, the only begotten son? And, and, and really what, what, what I want us to recognize is he's from God. Jesus is from God. As, as Jesus begins presenting what he presents to the world, right? If we went to read the Gospels, he starts preaching. He starts telling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he starts teaching them these things. And what we have to recognize is he is from God. Jesus says over and over again, I and the Father are one, right? I speak only what God, the Father has told me to speak. I do only what the Father has told me to do. And so what we want to recognize that he's from God. Everything that we can learn from Jesus Christ is from God. One way that I, I think of this being explained is through the word, word, which is kind of a funny word um, to talk about, but word, right? If we went to the Gospel of John, in the first verse it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, what is the word? Are we talking about, you know, sometimes we call this the word, is is that what John in John 1 is talking about? No, he, he's talking about Jesus. And we, we know this from context and what he actually says later on in the chapter. But not only is it Jesus, the, why he uses this word, word, is because it's, it's a living expression. It's a revelation of who God is. And so as we think about who Jesus is, what I want us, what we're talking about, the fact here that he's from God, is it's everything we need to know about God is revealed through Jesus Christ. Everything we need to know about God is revealed through Jesus Christ. He, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews opens up with this. It says, God, who in various uh, different times has spoken to us, has at this time spoken to us through his Son. And God is speaking to us. God is revealing himself to us through Jesus. Jesus is from God. We understand who God is by looking at Jesus. But not only is he from God, 
He is God. I have to mention this. And, 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 and sometimes, again, we're going to struggle to understand some of these words. But when it says Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not just one of his, it's not like Jesus' last name is Christ. You guys ever think that? You guys ever think? No? Okay. I thought it was funny, but okay. But so it's not his last name. It's not just another, you know, sometimes there's, you know, I think of medieval kings and they've all got 400 different titles, right? And, and, you know, the owner of this plot of land and it's like a little dump, you know, but he's got another title, right? You know, and it's for Jesus, that's not, this is like, Jesus has a lot of names that have a lot of meaning and each of them has a purpose. And when these Christians in the first century, these Jewish believers were saying Christ, they were saying Messiah. They were saying he is their king. He is the anointed one. He is literally, okay, so we're talking about from God. Well, literally every promise from God in the Old Testament to the Jewish people is fulfilled in their Messiah, who is Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that God has promised. And when, when Peter says he is the Lord, he is the master, he is king, he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He is God. Listen, there is no one else in all of history, and there is no one else today that can fulfill everything that God promised if he's not God. Jesus is, he is God. He's not just from God. He doesn't just reveal to us who God is. He reveals to us who God is because he is God. And what I want us to see is that he is the God of mercy. Look at that. I think it's verse 3. He says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy... According to his abundant mercy. Jesus is the God of mercy. And when we say that, again, I want us to like take our understanding of mercy and say maybe there's more to it, right? When I think of mercy, I think of my kids when they're in trouble, right? And for me, mercy for my kids is when I'm too lazy to actually give them the punishment they deserve, right? Like, I'm glad they know they're in trouble. I really should enforce a lesson so that they know not to do this again. But instead, I don't want to get off the couch. So, all right, don't do it again, right? That's mercy. You know, maybe mercy is, you know, you know, someone wronged me, a, a friend or, or, or a coworker wronged me, and, and really I should get them fired, but I'll be merciful. I'll hate them for the rest of my life and never talk to them again, but I'll be merciful. I won't get them fired. Right? Do you see, like, how we have our own bent and our own vengeance within our own mercy? Like, the way we, we relate to each other is always going to be what's best for me. Yeah, God's mercy it wasn't just seeking his own good. It's, it's for our good. That's for us. He relinquishes the condemnation. And do, not only does he relinquish condemnation, he takes our condemnation. He pays the penalty. He takes the price. Our God is a God of mercy. So Jesus, who is he? He is the God of mercy. And this is where we get our living hope from. It's from the God of mercy. Where else do we get the, like where do we get this living hope from? Well, it's from Jesus and what he has done. It's from Jesus and what he's done. Look at this. We're still in verse number three. We're going, we're taking our time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. These are fun words. Uh, I I think another translation says, has given us new birth 
Like when we talk about begotten, it's, it's, it's our child, it's, it's new birth. And God has given us a new birth. I think of Nicodemus talking to Jesus on the, mount, or on the rooftop. And he's saying, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, what? You know, that doesn't even make sense. But, but God has given us new life. He's given us this new birth. And if we have this new birth, then we have living hope. And how did we get this living hope? Well, it's, it says right here, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What did Jesus do? I want to tell a story. And I know I said I want to be brief, but I want to tell probably the biggest story in all of history. Because... It is all of history. You see, God, complete in and of himself, needs nothing, is holy, is perfect, decides to create. And our God is a creator. And, it, and he made everything. He spoke and everything began to exist. And, it, and it's good. It's wonderful. He's, he literally declares everything he's creating. It's good. And then he made man. And it was good. And, and he created man and now he's conversing with man. And he gives men, man, he gives him rules, and he gives him blessings. He gives him purpose. He gives him identity. He gives him, like, he creates mankind, and it's wonderful. And mankind says, cool, but I want to try it my own way. Mankind rebels against God. Against the literal design for which it was created. It goes against the rules, the commands, the, the heart, the desire of our God. This desire for fellowship and unity and communion. And instead decides to do things our own way apart from God. And the condemnation for that is life apart from God. Which isn't even life, it's just death. There is no life apart from God. God created man. Man rebelled against his creator and received condemnation. But even from the very beginning, God delivers his creation. God makes a way for his creation to still have life. And God gives a promise of a coming Savior, the first promise of a Savior, the first promise of an anointed one who would do the work that only God could do to destroy Satan. So he makes a way for his, his people to have life with him. And he gives a promise of a coming Savior. And throughout all of history, what we can look through, through all of this book, is how God is preparing a way for his people to have life with him. And all of that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did is he is God who took on human flesh and was born in a manger. In the last two weeks, I've, I've quoted from a passage in Philippians that says, um, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also, who took a, who being in the very form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant. And that's what we celebrate every Christmas, is when Jesus, God himself, Emmanuel, God is now with us because he takes on human flesh. He becomes a baby. That blows my mind to think about. When we look at the manger, that's not just a baby. That is the God of all creation. Man, this God of mercy that we're talking about, that's, that's him. He humbled himself to this, this point of dependence on other people. 
So Jesus, God himself, steps down into his own creation and, and he preaches and he calls people to him. He calls people to this life. He offers new life. And the only way we can have this life is if he pays the penalty, if he takes our place, if he becomes the sacrificial lamb that dies in our place. And so Jesus willingly walks to the cross. He carries his cross. He's nailed to that cross. And he dies on that cross. He died on my cross. He died in my place. He paid the penalty of my sins. And that would be beautiful and wonderful, but it wouldn't be enough. But guess what? Jesus isn't dead. You can't kill God. The audacity sometimes when we when we the world thinks that God is dead. No, God's not dead. God rose from the dead. How do we have living hope? Because Jesus is alive. Because of the resurrection. Because not only can God forgive me of the sins now, God has power over the afterlife. And the life that is yet to come is in his control. And if God, who can conquer death and destroy the grave, has offered me new life, well, my hope is alive. Man, our living hope is because of what Jesus has done. I'm not waiting for Jesus to do something. Jesus has already done it. You know, we we, we read the Old Testament And they're looking forward to a coming Savior. They're looking forward to the Messiah. They don't understand, and I'm not saying I fully understand, but they're looking forward to this happening. But we're looking back, and we're seeing what he has done. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty of our sins, and he proved his power over the, uh, not just this life, but the next by raising from the dead. And so because of that, we can have hope. <clears throat> and where does our living hope come from it comes from Jesus and what he's doing. I want us to, to pick out a couple different things he says right here, okay? So if you notice here, it says, uh, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. How do I have a living hope? Well, it's because of what God's still doing. Because Jesus is still actively working in my life. Because Jesus has reserved this life, this inheritance, this future life of mine, this eternal life in heaven. He's reserved it in heaven and he's keeping it in my daily life as I'm I'm walking this path, as as I'm living life trying to follow Jesus. He is guiding, he's protecting, he is leading, he is providing, he's delivering. He is actively working in our lives. Listen, I have no hope if Jesus is passive. I have no hope if he's apathetic. I have hope because Jesus is actively working in my life. So where does living hope come from? The answer is Jesus. And Jesus alone. And then the next question I want to ask is what is, we we keep talking about it, but what is living hope? (laughs) I'm going to be fairly repetitive. It's Jesus. Okay? (laughs) And, 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 and you know, I say it's Jesus because it's completely, entirely dependent upon him. There is no hope. There's no living hope apart from Jesus Christ. And so there are times when, when I speak of him and I sing of him and, and, and we name our church and we're saying we belong to Jesus. He is our living hope. And so I want us to understand when we read living hope, we cannot read living hope apart from Jesus. Our living hope has to be in Jesus. 
And it's not in, in, in any, uh, any other good works. It's not in any other profit. And it's not in what we can achieve or what we can do. It is only in the work that Jesus has done and is doing. Because he alone is God. He alone is our redeemer. So first of all, our living hope is Jesus. Now, I wrote something down. And if you guys didn't grab one of the sermon notes, then I'd ask you to, before you leave today, grab one of these. I didn't put any blanks in this because I, I want it to be clear. Here's what I wrote down. I said, living hope is a confident assurance in the power of God actively working in our lives to accomplish his promises and purpose for the life that is yet to come. I want to break this down just a little bit. Living hope is a confident assurance. So first of all, confident assurance is kind of an interesting uh, concept here because we're using the word hope. And my understanding of hope is I hope, I hope not to get in trouble. I hope not to get caught. I hope to eat more sometime. I hope to that when I eat that Reese's, I'm not going to gain another 15 pounds, right? Like, I hope, like, like, hope is just this wishy-washy, you know, it doesn't matter what's actually happening, you know, <laughs> like, sometimes we do something that we know the end result, but we really hope the end result's not going to be what we already know it's going to be, right? Like, it's this, this fanciful image, this, this, you know, this feeling of, you know, this lackluster, or not lackluster, but this, like, feeling of, uh, you know, I hope, I hope, I hope, my kids hope all the time that I don't see them doing what they know they're not supposed to do. Guess what? They're not sneaky. My son came in the room the other day, and he's like, did I scare you? I'm like, no, not, not at all. And he came back a little bit later, and he's just like, has anyone ever scared you as an adult? Nope. So anyway, he's trying. He's trying. He's not sneaky. He's, he's got hope. But man, this, this hope that we're talking about, it's something different. Because when we know who Jesus is, and we know what he's done, and then we actually see him actively working in our lives, man, I'm confident that the things that he said will come true. I know this. I have, I have not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. And, and not only is it a head knowledge and a heart knowledge, I'm going to allow that to affect the way I live my life. A living hope, it, number one, it's this confident assurance, but number two, it's also living. It's the way we live. Man, how can we have a living hope? Well, number one, Jesus is alive. That means he's not dead. And he's given me, me, new life, not death. This living hope, it, it, it's, it's living, it's breathing, it's growing. And it's growing because it's a confident expectation, a confident assurance in Jesus. Living hope is a confident assurance in the power of God actively working in our lives to accomplish his promises and purpose for the life that is yet to come. This living hope, you know, in, in the passage here, you know, he, he kind of describes it a little bit. He calls it an inheritance, right? He says this, number one, we've, uh, uh, in verse number three, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has given us new life to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. So this, this inheritance, that you know, listen, there's, there's an aspect of this new life, this new birth, that's now. There's a present reality to this hope that we have. We have hope for the future because of what's actively happen, happening right now. 
because I have life with God, because he does speak to me, he does walk with me and guide me. He, he is actively my God. I, and listen, this life that we're looking forward to, this inheritance that we have, listen, this inheritance is not some mansion on, on some street of gold. Like, I mean, maybe that's part of it. I don't, you know, like, I don't even know if that's true or not because, you know, Revelation talks about one street of gold, not streets of gold. And so, like, maybe I'm on dirt street. I don't know. But, like, listen, like, that's all just, like, minor little details. What is our eternal life? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Jesus. What did God create us for? What did God design us for? What is our purpose? It's life with God. To experience Him. To worship Him. To glorify Him. To commune with Him. This is what we get to do for all of eternity. Listen. This living hope, it's a present reality because Jesus is already living with us. But the hope, the inheritance, the desire that we have for all of eternity is more life with Jesus. But some of it's not yet. Because we're still here with flesh, with sin, with desires to do things not God's way. And so there's a hope that we have. In in Revelation, it talks about a day when there will be no more weeping, there will be no more tears, there will be no more fighting, no more pain. We have a hope of a life with God that lasts forever, and it's yet to come. So listen, our, our living hope, it is in Jesus Christ and the work that he has done and what he is doing. It's a present reality because God is working in our lives and it's a future hope because what he's doing is good. How how do we do this? I'll be honest, this next line on the, on the, the notes is kind of not well written. I'm sure someone with an English major can come correct it. I just want to ask the question of how do we do this? How can we actually live with living hope? You know, maybe for some of you, you don't have hope. You don't have life with Jesus. Maybe there's this aspect of uh, of you're trying to do life And really, you're just trying to do it your own way. You're not walking with Jesus. You don't even know who he is. I said that Jesus died on the cross in your place, and maybe you don't even know what that means. And what I want us all to recognize is whether you've never recognized this before or if you have recognized this before, this this, this living hope that we, that we are supposed to have that we get to praise God for, it only comes through faith. Verse verse number five there, it says this. This inheritance that we have, it's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is faith? Right? Faith is this interesting uh, word, and, and really, I'll be honest with you, sometimes what I call faith is very similar to hope, a biblical understanding of hope. These things go hand in hand, but there's an aspect to both of these that involves an action. This living hope, it's, it's active. We're, we're actively living and growing and, and, and moving. It's It's alive. And our faith needs to be the same way. Romans chapter number 10. (coughs) Paul says this. He says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's, there's two words he's using here, and both these words are what I use to define and explain what faith is. It's confess and believe. 
Listen, I've told the story, and and I, I hope all of you have heard and know that God, your creator, created you for a purpose to have life with him, and he has made a way through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you to receive forgiveness of your sins. You, even though you've rejected God and rebelled against him, you can have life with God because of what Jesus did. And I hope I pray, I don't just pray for you guys here, I pray for all of Green River, I pray for all of Wyoming, I pray for everyone to believe this, to know this, there's an aspect of knowing the truth and the validity of who Jesus is and what he has done. But there's another word there, it's confess, to admit, there's an action tied to this, see faith is active. Faith isn't just something you believe. Faith is something you act on. It's a belief that you act on. You have to confess. You have to admit that you've sinned and rejected God. And you have to, you have to ask him to forgive you. You have to come to Jesus, the God of mercy, the one who rose from the dead. And you have to come to him to receive forgiveness. You have to believe it. Listen, this life, this living hope, it it, it comes from Jesus. It is Jesus, right? It's Jesus doing it. Paul says in Galatians, right? It's not even my life I'm living. It's Jesus Christ living through me, right? Galatians 2.20, right? It's like Jesus is living through us. This is Jesus' life. But what he requires from us is faith, to believe him and to take a step. We can't save ourselves. We can't die on the cross. We can't can't be our own savior. We can't be the Messiah. But what I can do is I can believe what Jesus has said, who he is, and I can take a step towards him. We're following Jesus. This is a life lived following Jesus. This is our living hope, that we are walking with our God, that we are following him. So how do we live this life of living hope? Well, it has to be through faith. But secondly, I want us to look at something else. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter number 3, we're already in 1 Peter, but if you go to chapter number 3, Peter says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Listen, if we have a living hope, if we're actually acting like we're alive if we have this life with God and we live in this confident assurance that God is actively living with us, if we actually live with this living hope, people see it. And not only do people see it, we need to share it. I, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not a savior I'm not a Messiah. I'm not a deliverer. I'm just someone who's living with God today and looking forward to living with him forever because of Jesus and what he's done. And if I actually lived my life like I'm living with Jesus right now, like I actually have a living hope, that should impact the people around me. And we need to be willing to share that. This living hope, it's not just for you. God loved the whole world, and he was willing to die on the cross for all of us. How do we live with this hope? Well, through faith and by sharing it. If you look at our slide, if you look at our, um, our logo, our mission statements, Living Hope Church, it says to serve and to share. This is one of the primary purposes 
of our existence as followers of Jesus Christ is to share with others the hope that he has given us. So, I'm going to give you a homework. You guys like homework? Jacob and back is very angry right now. You'll, you'll survive. Are, are there a thumbs up? It looked like you were shaking fists. I didn't see thumbs. Okay. Listen, I, I, I'm perfectly fine if you disagree with my definition. But what I want to ask you, I want, want everyone to do is to take this definition of for living hope. Living hope is a confident assurance in the power of God actively working in our lives to accomplish his promises and purpose for the life that is yet to come. I want you to take that and I want you to pray over it this week. I want you to ask God what that actually means. I want you to actually try, like, listen, if you go and you pray and, and God starts speaking to you and, and he's like, hey, this is, you know, you should change this word. Come tell me. I'll, I'll work on it. I'll change it. I'm not beholden to this. Like, this is just my words trying to understand what God is doing, right? And I want you to do the same. I want you to actually try to understand in your life if you have a living hope. How is Jesus working in your life? Is it giving you assurance? Is it giving you confidence? Are you living a different way because of what God is doing? Do you see what God is doing? Do you believe that he's actively working in your life? Do you actually believe in life after death? Or are you fearful and worried? Or are you uncertain? Do you have living hope? Lord, we come to you today and my prayer is not that we would be braggadocious or egotistical or think that this confidence that we get from you is just for our own way. We recognize that you are doing a great work, not just for us, but for the whole world. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, that as we respond to you today, that we would trust that you alone, the God of mercy, can do what we cannot. And to trust you, not with just what you said, but how we live our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.